Welcome to a, uh, another Authors at Google talk. I'm Alexander Neiman, one of the writers here. Um, I'm really thrilled today to welcome the first woman to be uh, on the UK national Quake team, uh, Alice Taylor. Alice, we are not worthy. How totally badass is that? Oh, and also apparently her husband's written a book. Um, it's a really great pleasure to welcome Cory Doctorow to Google New York. Uh, we know he's graced Mountain View with his presence. Uh, Cory's author of uh, many books, uh, Eastern Standard Tribe, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, Overclocked, uh, and several other collections. Um, he's been a member of the, yeah, worked for the EFF for four years in the UK and is now a fellow of the EFF. He's a staunch advocate of things like the Creative Commons, under which license his book is also released uh, digitally, as well as being available in print, and uh, an advocate of privacy rights and all sorts of other things, and perhaps best known as a co-editor of Boing Boing and for his red cape and goggles. So, without <laughs> further ado, back to Cory Doctorow, author of Little Brother. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to read to you a bit from a section of this book, Little Brother. How many of you have read the book? Uh, okay, so kind of a third, maybe. I'm going to read to you a section from the book. Um, it's uh, in chapter 12, and it's, it's, the book is about uh, young adults, uh, teenagers who live in San Francisco, who play alternate reality games, who hack their devices and modify them and improve them, and who, um, and who discover after a terrorist attack on the Bay Area that, that destroys the Bay Bridge, that in fact, as bad and terrifying as a terrorist attack is, it at least has an ending, whereas the police response to a terrorist attack has no graceful ending. It, it, it continues unbounded and has a natural inertia that causes it to grow and grow and grow. And in the name of security, all things are possible, uh, even when it involves eroding your constitutional liberties. And they decide to do what everyone who's had their freedom taken away has had to do eventually, which is to take it back. And they do it with with three things that I think are actually probably near and dear to Googler's hearts and are near and dear to my heart as a kind of geek who spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. Um, the first thing they do is they decide they're going to take back control of their devices. You know, like many of you, I started using personal computers around 1979. My dad was a computer science teacher. He brought home an Apple II Plus. Um, it, it only got uppercase letters. Uh, we had to shout. Um, and th the only way to get lowercase letters was to take the modem card out, and none of us wanted to do that because it meant chopping off access to the, the wide world of networks, of, of BBSs and so on, through which I was able as a nine-year-old to gain access to people, ideas, uh, tools, conversations, and communities that I, even the most powerful and sophisticated adults just a few years before, couldn't have had without a dedicated staff of people helping them out. And that only got better. I mean, every year that went by, that got better, and to, the computer became the tool that gave me maximum control over my life and agency in terms of how I reacted to the rest of the world. And I think that if I were a young adult today, I would feel very differently about that technology. I think that young adults today have an experience of a technology that's different from mine, in which technology is often adversarial. It's going back to a, an, an earlier period where people used to wear badges that said, I am a free person, do not bend, spindle, fold, or mutilate me. Uh, and, and they're finding that technology is deployed most commonly to control them, to surveil them, and to, spot, and to snitch them out. Um, and so they decide to take back control of it. They decide that, uh, in the words of Dale Doherty, the publisher of Make Magazine, if you can't open it, you can't own it. They figure out how to open the devices that they have, how to replace their firmware, and how to use them to build a cryptographically secured network of, um, of hacked Xboxes uh, that overlays uh, San Francisco and that can't be wiretapped. Um, the second thing they do is they change the conversation about security by learning more about mathematics, um, particularly about the statistics of rare occurrences. Um, as, as human beings, we have poor intuition about rare occurrences. Las Vegas is a testament to this. Um, you know, uh, a, a smart response to Las Vegas would be, how could they build those casinos unless everyone who landed here lost everything? Uh, the actual response to Las Vegas is, holy moly, think of all the money I'm going to take from these suckers with their big casinos. Um, so they decide that they're going to start talking about what, what a rare occurrence means, and more particularly, what it means to detect a rare occurrence with an algorithm. And while a, an algorithm may be a good way to detect um, things like uh, when a sysadmin needs to look at a server because it's behaving anom anomalously, um, as a means of determining who gets justice and who doesn't, or who's under suspicion and who isn't, it's sadly inadequate. If you're testing for something that occurs one in a million times, with an algorithm that's uh, one in 100 or 99 in 100 accurate, then out of um, a million tests, you'll get 10,000 inaccurate responses. So your 99% accurate test be, uh, gets gets it wrong 9,999 times out of 10,000. Uh, the last thing they do is they get involved in electoral politics. Um, 
this being the only sure method that we have through uh, history of, of changing society over a protracted period. You might be able to use uh, civil disobedience and protest to change society over a short term uh, to convince the current rulers that your case is just, but if you want the next round of rulers to do the right thing when, you, when, when uh, they take office, you need a kind of legislative layer on top of it. And so they get involved in electoral politics. And like teenagers who've been involved in electoral politics uh, in every election uh, that has ever mattered in this country, um, they stuff envelopes, they knock on doors, they use technology, um, and they speak with the moral authority of people whose worlds will be determined by the outcome of, of this electoral race. So in the reading that I'm about to give you, uh, Mikey uh, uh, Marcus is the founder of Axnet. He goes by Mikey, M1K3Y when he's online, uh, is the founder of the Axnet, and he's uh, had a key signing party, a cryptographic key signing party that involved building and smashing a laptop after it had been used to generate the keys to make sure that the keys would never be recovered off of it, at which he met a young woman uh, whom he uh, hit it off with. And um, they're go going on their first date in Mission Dolores Park in San Francisco. Uh, the um, date is an open air concert, an illegal one that was organized using the XNet. And that's where the action starts, just as they are about to go out for a burrito. Mission burritos are an institution. They are cheap, giant, and delicious. Imagine a tube the size of a bazooka shell filled with spicy grilled meat, guacamole, salsa, tomatoes, refried beans, rice, onions, and cilantro. It has the same relationship to Taco Bell that a Lamborghini has to a Hot Wheels car. There are about 200 Mission Burrito joints. They're all heroically ugly with uncomfortable seats and minimal decor, faded Mexican tourist office posters and electrified frame Jesus and Mary holograms and loud mariachi music. The thing that distinguishes them mostly is what kind of exotic meat they fill the burritos with. The really authentic places have brains and tongue, which I never order, but it's nice to know they're there. The place we went to had both brains and tongue, which we didn't order. I got carne asada and she got shredded chicken, and we each got a big cup of horchata. As soon as we sat down, she unrolled her burrito and took a little bottle out of her purse. It was a little stainless steel aerosol canister that looked for all the world like a pepper spray self-defense unit. She aimed it at her, at her burrito's exposed guts and misted them with a fine red oily spray. I caught a whiff of it and my throat closed and my eyes watered. What the hell are you doing to that poor defenseless burrito? She gave me a wicked smile. I'm a spicy food addict, she said. This is capsaicin oil in a mister. Capsaicin? Yeah, the stuff in pepper spray. This is like pepper spray, but slightly more dilute and way more delicious. You can think of it as spicy Cajun visine if that helps. My eyes burned just thinking of it. You're kidding, I said. You are so not going to eat that. Her eyebrows shot up. That sounds like a challenge, son. You just watch me. She rolled the burrito up as carefully as a stoner rolling up a joint, tucking the ends in, then rewrapping it in the tinfoil. She peeled off one end and brought it up to her mouth, poised with it just before her lips. Right up to the time she bit into it, I didn't believe that she was going to do it. I mean, that was basically an anti-personnel weapon she just slathered on her dinner. She bit into it, chewed swallowed, gave every impression of having a delicious meal. Want a bite, she said, innocently. Yeah, I said, hey, I like spicy food. I always get the chilies with four cur with the curries with four chilies next to them when we order in from the Pakistani place. I peel back more foil and took a big bite. Big mistake. You know that feeling you get when you take a big bite of horseradish or wasabi or whatever, and it feels like your sinuses are closing at the same time as your windpipe, filling your head with trapped nuclear hot air that tries to batter its way out through your watering eyes and nostrils, that feeling like steam is about to pour out of your ears like a cartoon character? This was a lot worse. This was like putting your hand on a hot stove, only it's not your hand. It's the entire inside of your head and your esophagus all the way down to your stomach. My entire body sprung out in a sweat, and I choked and choked. Wordlessly, she passed me my horchata, and I managed to get the straw into my mouth and suck hard on it, gulping down half of it in one go. So there's a scale, the Scoville scale, that we chili fanciers use to talk about how spicy a pepper is. Pure capsaicin's about 15 million Scovilles. Uh, Tabasco's about 2,500, and pepper spray is a healthy 3 million. This stuff's a puny 100 grand, about as hot as a mild scotch bonnet pepper. I worked up to it in about a year. Some of the real hardcore can get up to a half million or so. That's like 20 times hotter than Tabasco. It's pretty freaking hot. At temperatures that hot, your whole brain gets a wash in endorphins. It's a better body stone than hash, and it's good for you. I was getting my sinuses back now, able to breathe without gasping. Of course, you do get a ferocious ring of fire when you go to the john, she said, winking at me. Youch, you are insane, I said. Fine talk from a man whose hobby is building and smashing laptops, she said. 
Touche, I said, and touched my forehead. Want some? She held out the mister. Pass, I said quickly enough that we both laughed. When we left the restaurant and headed for Dolores Park, she put her arm around my waist, and I found that she was just the right height for me to put my arm around her shoulders. That was new. I'd never been a tall guy, and the girls I dated had all been my height or taller. Teenage girls grow faster than teenage guys, which is a cruel trick of nature. So this was nice. It felt nice. We turned the corner on 20th Street and walked towards Dolores. Before we'd taken a single step, we could feel the buzz. It was like the hum of a million bees. There were lots of people streaming toward the park, and when I looked there, I saw that it was about a hundred times more crowded than it had been when I went to meet Ange. The sight made my blood run hot. It was a beautiful, cool night, and we were about to party, really party, party like there was no tomorrow, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Without saying anything, we both broke into a trot. There were lots of cops with tense faces, but what the hell were they going to do? There were a lot of people in the park. I'm not so good at counting crowds. The organizers, the papers later quoted organizers as saying there were 20,000 people. The cops said 5,000. Maybe that means there were 12,500. Whatever, it was more people than I'd ever stood among as part of an unscheduled, unsanctioned, illegal event. We were among them in an instant. I can't swear to it, but I don't think that there was anyone over 25 in that press of bodies. Everyone was smiling. Some young kids were there, 10 or 12, and that made me feel better. No one would do anything too stupid with kids that little in the crowd. No one wanted to see little kids get hurt. This was just going to be a glorious spring night of celebration. I figured the thing to do was push in toward the tennis courts. We threaded our way through the crowds, and to stay together, we took each other's hands, only staying to together didn't require us to intertwine fingers. That was strictly for pleasure, and it was very pleasurable. The bands were all inside the tennis courts with their guitars and mixers and keyboards and even a drum kit. Later on Xnet, I found a Flickr stream of them smuggling all this stuff in piece by piece in gym bags and under their coats. Along with it all were huge speakers, the kind you see in automotive supply places, and among them a stack of car batteries. Genius, I laughed. That was how they were going to power the stacks. From where I stood, I could see that they were cells from a hybrid car, a Prius. Someone had gutted an ecomobile to power the night's entertainment. The batteries continued outside the courts, stacked up against the fence, tethered to the main stack by wires threaded through the chain link. I counted 200 batteries. Christ, those things weighed a ton, too. There's no way they organized this without email and wikis and mailing lists, and there's no way people this smart did that on the public internet. This had all taken place on the Xnet. I bet my boots on it. We just kind of bounced around in the crowd for a while as the bands tuned up and conferred with one another. I saw Trudy do from a distance in the tennis courts. She looked like she was in a cage, like a pro wrestler. She was wearing a torn wife beater and her hair was in long fluorescent pink dreads down to her waist. She had on army camouflage pants and giant gothy boots with steel overtoes. As I watched, she picked up a heavy motorcycle jacket as worn as a catcher's mitt and put it on like it was armor. It probably was armor, I realized. I tried to wave to her to impress Ange, I guess, but she didn't see me and I kind of looked like a spaz, so I stopped. The energy in the crowd was amazing. You hear people talk about vibes and energy to describe big groups of people, but until you've experienced it, you probably think it's just a figure of speech. It's not. It's the smiles, infectious, and big as watermelons on every face, everyone bopping a little to an unheard rhythm, shoulders rocking, rolling walks, jokes and laughs, the tone of every voice tight and excited, like a firework about to go off, and you can't help be a part of it because you are. By the time the bands kicked off, I was utterly stoned on the crowd vibe. The opening act was some kind of Serbian turbo folk, which I couldn't figure out how to dance to. I know how to dance to exactly two kinds of music, trance, shuffle around and let the music move you, and punk, bash around and mosh until you get hurt or exhausted or both. The next act were Oakland hip hoppers backed by a thrash metal band, which is better than it sounds, and then some bubblegum pop, and then Speed Horse took the stage and Trudy Doo stepped up to the mic. My name is Trudy Dew, and you're an idiot if you trust me. I'm 32, and it's too late for me. I'm, st I'm lost. I'm stuck in the old way of thinking. I still take my freedom for granted and let other people take it away from me. You're the first generation to grow up in Gulag America, so you know what your freedom is worth to the last goddamn cent. 
The crowd roared. She was playing fast little skittery nervous chords on her guitar and her bass player, a huge girl with a dikey haircut and even bigger boots and a smile you could open beer bottles with, was laying it down fast and hard already. I wanted to bounce. I bounced. Ange bounced with me. We were sweating freely in the evening, which reeked of perspiration and pot smoke. Warm bodies crushed in on all sides of us, and they bounced too. Don't trust anyone over 25, she shouted. We roared. We were one big animal throat, roaring. Don't trust anyone over 25. Don't trust anyone over 25. Don't trust anyone over 25. She banged some hard chords on her guitar, and the other guitarist, a little pixie of a girl whose face bristled with piercings, jammed in, going wheedledy wheedledy dee way up high past the 12th fret. It's our goddamn city. It's our goddamn country. No terrorist can take it from us for so long as we're free. Once we're not free, the terrorists win. Take it back. Take it back. You're young enough and stupid enough not to know that you can't possibly win, so you're the only ones who can lead us to victory. Take it back. Take it back. We roared. She jammed down hard on her guitar. We roared that note back to her, and then it got really, really loud. I danced until I was so tired I couldn't dance another step. Ange danced alongside of me. Technically, we were rubbing our sweaty bodies against each other for several hours, but I was totally not being a horn dog about it. We were dancing, lost in the godbeat and the thrash and the screaming, take it back, take it back. When I couldn't dance anymore, I grabbed her hand and she squeezed mine like I was keeping her from falling off a building. She dragged me toward the edge of the crowd where it got thinner and cooler. Out there on the edge of Dolores Park, we were in the cool air and the sweat on our bodies went instantly icy. She threw her arms around my, she shivered and threw her arms around my waist. Warm me, she commanded. I didn't need a hint. I hugged her back. Her heart was an echo of the fast beats from the stage. Break beats now, fast and furious and wordless. She smelled of sweat, a sharp tang that smelled great. I knew I smelled of sweat, too. My nose was pointed into the top of her head, and my face was right at her collarbone. She moved my hands to her neck and tugged. Get down here. I didn't bring a stepladder, is what she said. And I tried to smile, but it's hard to smile when you're kissing. Like I said, I'd kissed three girls in my life. Two of them had never kissed anyone before, and one had been dating since she was 12, but she had issues. None of them kissed like Ange. Slowly, gently, we lowered ourselves to the grass. We lay on our sides and clutched at each other, kissing and kissing. The world disappeared so that there was only the kiss. Not here, she said. Let's move over there. She pointed across the street at the big white church that gives Mission Dolores Park and the mission their name. Holding hands, moving quickly, we crossed to the church. It had big pillars in front of it. She put my back up against one of them and pulled my face down to hers again. My hands went quickly and boldly to her shirt. I slipped them up the front. That's when the sirens started. They were louder than anything I'd ever heard. A sound like a physical sensation, like something blowing you off your feet. A sound as loud as your ears could process, and then louder. Disperse immediately, a voice said, like the voice of God rattling in my skull. This is an illegal gathering. Disperse immediately. The band had stopped playing. The noise of the crowd across the street changed. It got scared, angry. I heard a click as the, as the PA system of speakers and car batteries in the tennis courts powered back up. Take it back! It was a defiant yell like a sound shouted into the surf or screamed off a cliff. Take it back! The crowd growled, a sound that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Take it back, they chanted. Take it back! Take it back! Take it back! The, the police moved in in lines, carrying plastic shields, wearing Darth Vader helmets that covered their faces. Each one had a black truncheon and infrared goggles. They looked like soldiers out of some futuristic war movie. They took a step forward in unison, and every one of them banged his truncheon on his shield, a cracking noise like the earth splitting. Another step, another crack. They were all around the park and closing in now. Disperse immediately, the voice of God said again. There were helicopters overhead now. No floodlights, though. The infrared goggles, right, of course. They'd have infrared skies, scopes in the sky, too. I pulled Ange back against the doorway of the church, tucking us back from the cops and the choppers. Take it back, the PA roared. It was Trudy Dew's rebel yell, and I heard her guitar thrash out some chords, then her drummer playing, then that big, deep bass. Take it back, the crowd answered, and they boiled out of the park at the police lines. I'd never been in a war, but now I think I know what it must be like. What it must be like when scared kids charge across a field in an opposing force, knowing what's coming, running anyway, screaming, hollering. Disperse immediately, the voice of God said. It was coming from trucks parked all around the park, trucks that had swung into place in the last few seconds. That's when the mist fell. It came out of the choppers, and we just caught the edge of it. 
It made the top of my head feel like it was going to come off. It made my sinuses feel like they were being punctured with ice picks. It made my eyes swell and water and my throat close. Pepper spray, not 100,000 Scovilles, a million and a half. They gassed the crowd. So that's the reading. So now comes the formal Q&A if you have any questions. I guess you need to use the side mics. How heavy is that watch? How heavy is the watch? It's surprisingly lightweight. It's uh, hollow. Um, so it's made by this um, Japanese designer. Uh, you can Google it. It's, uh, I've forgotten his name. It's a uh, Jap Japanese steampunk watch. You'll find it. And uh, he makes them mostly for like film sets and galleries. Uh, but he made four for sale, uh, two men's watches like this and two women's watches. And before I blogged it, I bought one. Uh, and so it does this. And then it, it has a catapult built in. Uh, it, uh, uh, it came with a rubber cockroach, so uh, when I t t opened it up in the hospital, in the hotel rather, the cockroach flew across the room. So I used it on the book tour in the groups of students, and uh, they all loved it. And amazingly, they always returned the cockroach, which I thought I was going to lose the cockroach for sure, but he's still in my suitcase. Yep. Um, you said that you released the book under Creative Commons as well. Mm -hmm. um, publishers tend to dislike uh, people mm -hmm. doing this, so... Uh, Firstly, how did you get away with it? And secondly, how do people with less notoriety than you get away with it? Well, I'll start by saying I didn't have a whole lot of notoriety when I, when I did it. Um, what I had was a great editor who's, in fact, sitting behind you. Um, other side. There he is, Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who's the senior editor at Tor Books. And uh, to me, it made a, a lot of intuitive sense. Um, I didn't think I was going to be able to stop people who love the book from scanning it. And having, uh, when, the, when the book wears scene first appeared, book wears with a Z, uh, uh, first of which is people who s slice the bindings off books and scan, I mean, it's Google Book Scan, but done in basements, right? Uh, slice the bindings off books, scan both, and it's destructive. Scan both sides of the page, OCR it, do as good a copy edit as they can, put it online, and, and then other people uh, do more copy editing, and they increment the version number without any version control system. I mean, it's really hairy. But I, when this started, a lot of science fiction writers went berserk, because they were like, oh my god, the, the food colorings in the swimming pool will never get it out, uh, no one will ever buy a book again. Uh, uh, it's all online. Uh, our audience have finally figured out how to destroy us. We, we knew they had it in for us all the time. That's why they would sometimes come up to us at science fiction conventions and say, your first book was great, but I hated all the ones since. And, and so they, um, they, uh, there was this huge disproportionate response. So I thought, you know, I'm going to try scanning one of these books, because I have an intuition that it's not easy. So I just tried it. I had a pretty good home scanner. It took me like 80 hours. And I'm sure with efficiency you can get better. You can get bulk feeders and so on. But I thought 80 hours, well, that's a lot of time for someone to spend in order to uh, convince other people that they should read a book. Because that's really the only reason you would scan a book, is to convince other people to read it, right? Because you love it. And reading is a social activity. I used to work in a bookstore. People would walk into the bookstore with their friends. And they would walk down the shelves. And they'd go, oh, you need to read this one. You need to read this one. You need to read this one. And they would bring a giant stack back up to the cash register and set it down. It was like always a red letter day when you had two friends come in and start doing this with each other in the, in the shelves. So, um, I thought, wow, that's a lot of time for these people to be spending trying to figure out how to promote books. Um, why don't I just give them the book and see what happens? And you know, it made good sense to Tor, uh, not because they believe information wants to be free, uh, not because they're patchouli-scented info hippies. Uh, Tor, is, Tor is a division of Holtzbrink. It's one of the largest publishers in the world. Tor itself is the largest science fiction publisher in the, in, in, in the planet, and as a result had been way out front on electronic publishing and had discovered, in Patrick's words, that electronic publishing in general had the worst ratio of hours spent in meetings to dollars in revenue generated in the history of publishing. So you know, starting with a bunch of a priori assumptions about what people wanted from electronic books and throwing them at them and hoping that they would then give you money in exchange turned out not to be a very good strategy, whereas um, throwing out a whole bunch of electronic books and then instrumenting them with things like Google so you could watch their diffusion um, it turned out to be a pretty good strategy because then you could see how people use them and try and work out where the revenue opportunities were. Um, given that we hadn't seen any evidence that sales were going down as a result of it and that the investment in a, in a book these days is actually relatively small. If it's a first novel, the advances are in the sort of six to $7,000 range. The setup is really cheap, especially for hardcovers compared to what it used to be. You might have noticed that it used to be that first novels were always paperbacks and then prestige books were always hardcovers. These days it's kind of the reverse because you can do pretty cheap setup for the, for the hardcover uh, and, and run you know, a couple thousand copies at a time and then run more if you need to. And so the risk was pretty low, the exposure was pretty low, and you can make a little perturbation in the system, formulate some hypotheses, 
try them out and go further from there. And it made sense for Patrick. Patrick, I was lucky, is a fairly geeky guy. We met on a BBS in the 80s. Uh, he runs his own Linux box and so on, administers his own movable type. So, so that was an easy sell, and it was an easy sell for Patrick because he runs the line. The, um, I've had more trouble, weirdly enough, with small boutique publishers who are supposed to be the ones that you go to if you want like, like super uh, uh, you know, personalized treatment. You know, so you go to these like little prestige literary houses to do your, your short story collections. They're like, we're going to do everything just the way you want it. We're going to be your partner, not like that big faceless corporate entity over there in the Flatiron building. You and me, we're going to be like doing this together, scrappy bandits. And, and then they say things like, well, we want to release this book under Creative Commons. We understand, but can we not release all the stories in one file? Can we release them in nine files? Because we think that'll help. And it's like, that'll help what? <laughs> that'll, that'll help people who, who, who don't know how to cat? I mean, I'm not sure <laughs> what it'll help, but I mean, if that makes you sleep better, and if that's the, if that's the deal breaker on this, then okay, by all means, let's, let's make that the way that we release this book. Um, and, and, you know, that's how I've done it. I, I've had remarkably good luck, actually, with big publishers who tend to have attracted one or two, at least, pretty smart senior people who think that technology is important and probably too important to decide what it's for a priori and that it needs continuous experimentation and iteration in the way of all the great, great technology businesses as opposed to the traditional mechanism of very slow iteration and lots of forward planning and so on, which characterizes you know, the, 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 the old uh, high, high coordination cost businesses. Uh, and um, you know, so, so like uh, Bertelsmann, which is the largest publisher in the world, uh, they did my German uh, translations of a bunch of my books. And they called me up and said, can we do this Creative Commons thing with your book? Like, do we have to ask your, like, like, what was it that your American publisher offered you in exchange for the right to do this? Because we're really interested in doing this, right? Like, how do we get your permission to do it, right? <laughs> and, then, and then a different Random House division, when I said, I would like to do uh, my audio book with you, but I will only sell it on a DRM-free basis. I don't want you to provide it with DRM at all. We're cool with doing it, whereas some of the smaller presses hadn't been as cool. Um, and I've had that experience kind of over and over again, where, where Big corporate entities tend to have at least a half dozen people in some kind of tiger team who are walking their way through the whole corporate entity going, like, can't we figure out some way to ring some new efficiency? We're having our lunch eaten over here. We haven't tried this. And, and they're happy to have a partner who's willing to do it too. In terms of how I would sell this to other people, if I was a writer, is I would go in and I would say, uh, well, we don't have great quantitative stuff on whether or not giving away free ebooks sells printed books. Um, because you need a time machine to do that. You'd have to go back and re-release the same book without CC licenses to see whether or not it, the sales went up or down. But what we do have is a lot of market signals and qualitative factors, including things like um, all the writers who've ever done it before did it again. Um, it outs, uh, 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 all the books that I know of that have done this with major publishers have done another print run. Well, publishers are pretty good at guessing print runs, which is how they keep their margins sane. And when you outsell uh, your print run, it means that your publisher made a pretty good guess about how many copies you thought you were going to sell, and you sold a little more, right? So those are the kind of qualitative metrics that economists pay a lot of attention to. And just because they're not quantitative doesn't mean that we should ignore them. Yeah? You've done something uh, a step further with the Creative Commons licensing with Little, little Brother and Librarians. Can you tell us how that's working out? Sure. Actually, the, the biggest problem I ever had with Creative Commons licenses was not that, they, that, that it didn't generate revenue but rather that people kept trying to give me money for the electronic books that I didn't want. Um, uh, I didn't want it for at least three reasons. The first is the accounting headache this, and, and the, the tax headache. The second is that it, there is something to be said for not collecting money directly from your audience as an artist in as much as it buffers you from the claim that I didn't pay you to write this, go write something different. It's one of the reasons that we don't collect money directly on Boing Boing. Um, if you've ever worked in, in you know, newspaper or magazine publishing, the writers aren't the ones selling the ads, right? And so there's supposed to be a wall between ad sales and, and, and circulation sales and, and, off, and, and editorial. And it, when they merge, it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And then the last reason was um, that I didn't like the way that d it, it de-aligned the incentives the publisher and the writer had. My publisher does a lot for me, not least the editorial services and making the books infinitely better by giving me great editorial feedback, but also having uh, an army of people who lay down shoe leather walking into stores across this country and explaining to them why they need to take some copies. That's not something I can replicate over the internet. And if there aren't copies sitting in front of you when you walk into the bookstore thinking, what's good this week? 
then you don't buy the book, right? They're, they're, you need to have both the people who know about the book and then buy a copy from Amazon, and the people who discover the book because it flits across their transom. So now I do this thing um, where instead of saying, thanks for the money, I don't want the money, um, I do this thing now where I, I'm paying someone, um, Olga Nunez, who's a musician and blogger and interesting person, to gather um, the names of schools and librarians who want copies of Little Brother and hard copy, and uh, then to match them up with people who want to thank me for the free ebook by buying a copy for, for a library or school. Um, and it's kind of expensive and clunky now because none of it's been automated. Uh, it's all happening by hand, but it doesn't need to be. Yep. Yeah. So I noticed that uh, your book isn't available on Kindle. Yeah. And is that because Amazon refuses to sell it without DRM? Yeah, that's right. And, and moreover, um, Amazon not only won't sell the the ebook without um, or the the ebook without DRM through the Kindle store, but the the other really important thing for me in terms of the audiobook is Amazon owns Audible, which is the largest audiobook publisher in the world. I'm an audiobook junkie, right? I spent thousands of dollars with Audible until I moved to Linux and discovered that I couldn't migrate my collection with me without figuring out how to break the DRM. And then all that stuff where I thought, oh, you know, it's only, I'm only a little bit pregnant, right? I'm only getting a little bit of DRM in my life. This will never hurt me, um, turned into a huge factor where I had to have three power books rolling 24-7 for a month in order to rip all that audio in real time using Audio Hijack, right? That was a huge nightmarish thing. And it was precisely because I was such a good Audible customer that I that I had that I was punished so unduly, um, and so uh, Audible has a policy where they won't sell books without DRM. They have a whole bunch of DRM-free products like their school lecture stuff, but they won't sell books without DRM, even if the author and the publisher don't want it. And Amazon now owns Audible, and Amazon because of that won't sell books through their MP3 store because it would be cutting into Audible's business, and they're upholding Audible's policy. Uh, this is really um, a bummer to me. I never thought I would see the day when Amazon refused to carry one of my books. Blows my mind. Yeah. So what do you wish for this book? Do you wish it to become like 19, Orwell's 1984 that postponed what the book was about? Mm -hmm. um, but, no. So I, I, someone asked me um, what the relationship of this book is to, to, to 1984. I call it 1984 fan fiction. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the instrumentality of this book, I think, uh, the instrumental purpose of this book is to give people hope about technology and rescue them from cynicism about technology and, and other subjects related like um, politics, which is a social technology. Um, so that people th see technology not just as an appliance, but as something you do. Uh, and so um, my sincere hope is that kids who read this will be inspired to think of technology as something that, that is... Um, subject to being opened, examined, improved, and, and then dissipated, rather than just something that, that kind of sits there doing what it was designed for, regardless of, of what you needed to do. Uh, and I think that if that becomes widespread and stays widespread, that it will become a powerful force for reshaping our society. Uh, in addition, I hope that it raises some awareness about the, the, the security apparatus that we exist in today. But I actually see the free and open platform issue, which I think Google's doing a really good job of fighting for with the Viacom suit, for example. Um, uh, are, is, is the er issue or the meta issue of, uh, of our day because it will determine the, the order of battle for every other fight that we fight from now on, right? That whether or not and how the internet is slanted towards different kinds of, of organizations and pressures and, and, um, and, or, and organizing um, and activism is going to determine what kind of battles we're allowed to have from now on. Did you? Thanks. Did, did, you, have, did you have a question? No. Oh, yeah. There. Um, so what do you think about uh, the relationship between electronic civil disobedience and kind of wider civil disobedience for uh, the more general political climate? And particularly if you happen to know, I know in the Bay Area there's a group, uh, Retort. and There's a group. Retort and Retort. Ian Bull, um, Afflicted Powers is a book they came out with a few years ago. Um, they're talking more kind of um, progressively about the role of technology and resistance in kind of old school uh, discussions. Uh, so any thoughts you have on that about like political resistance and, and the role of like electronic uh, disobedience? So I think that, that um, technology favors people who want to disrupt the status quo. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's always been thus. I think that you know, if, you, if you imagine yourself in the era of earthworks, um, you can either use earthworks to build a wall around your city, in which case you need to build a perfect wall, or you can use earthworks to undermine the wall and invade the city, in which case you need to find one imperfection. 
right? So the technology tends to favor the attackers who want to undermine the status quo, and that tends to be people who are involved in, in any kind of civic engagement, good or bad, right? Um, you know, it, it allowed, it allowed uh, an unorganized collective of teenagers to destroy the record industry, and it's allowing a tiny band of lawyers from the record industry to destroy the American body politic, right? To launch a denial of service attack on the American judicial system, on the American judicial system. So, you know, that, it, technology is, is um, great at disrupting the status quo no matter whose side you're on. Um, I think that uh, the, that that face-to-face -face civil disobedience and civil, civic engagement, as well as electronic civ civic engagement, has more than one reason for its existence. Right? Part of it is to help uh, advance your cause with people who don't know that they should be on your side, and to raise awareness about it, and to bring pressure to bear on politicians. And part of it is to create cohesion within the people who are who are trying to make that happen. So a demonstration that doesn't convince anyone, but gets a hundred people more tightly knit so that they can plan one that, that convinces more people is still a success. Um, technology makes it easier to do both halves of that. And so I think it's intensely complementary. Um, on the one hand, it helps you get the, the warm bodies out. On the other hand, it helps you stay in touch and, and intensify your social relationship afterwards. There's a story I like to tell about the way that technology disrupts the status quo uh, that I was a part of. When I was with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I was at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the UN agency that makes copyrights. Uh, it's like Mordor for copyright law. Um, and uh, uh, they were working on a treaty that they've been at for like seven years, and they'd spent millions of dollars on it, and the enormous forces arrayed against us, and we were this plucky band of just a few NGO people who'd scraped up the money to fly to Geneva and do this thing. And what we had were um, power books that could do ad hoc Wi-Fi. Uh, and so we did ad hoc Wi-Fi networks, and we used Subitha Edit to write a transcript of everything everyone in the room said during the meetings and publish it twice a day with editorial commentary. And the official transcript came out six months later after everyone who was quoted in it had the chance to redact anything they didn't want on the record. So we had, and it was written in this kind of very floral diplomatese. So it's like, you know, Mr. Chairman, as I stand today to take the podium at this, the 17th sitting of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, I wish to reiterate, as my lawyer McFred did, my, my great uh, uh, commendation for the great work you've done to date and our, my, my confidence that you will continue. And eventually you kind of get to the point which is like, I disagree, right? But it would take like seven paragraphs of this to, to so no one would read it. And ours were punchy, right? They were sarcastic. They were, and they got slashed on it. And for the first time, we published them twice a day. And for the first time in the history of WIPO, delegations, national delegations, were getting phone calls from their capitals at lunch about what they said at the, in the morning break, right, in the morning session. And they were being held to account. They were being lionized when they did good things. They were being uh, uh, villainized when they did bad things. Uh, and they, um, especially people who came from countries that couldn't afford to send a huge delegation to Geneva that had someone who was an expert in health, and someone who was an expert in food, and someone who was an expert in telecoms, and someone who was an expert in copyright, those countries tended to send two people who tended to be either experts in agriculture or, or textiles or health, depending on what the, um, the most important issue in that country was. And then they would fake it at all of the other missions, and they would get advice from uh, expert agencies. And at WIPO, the expert advice came from the Motion Picture Association and Pharma and the recording, uh, IFP, the, the, the RIAA's international wing, and so on. When we started publishing these, it totally changed the debate. Within about a year of doing this, the treaty was off the rails, and a year later it was shelved permanently. Um, when I started doing it, um, someone came up, to, someone uh, emailed me, someone who I quoted in it, uh, the, the head of um, one of the broadcasters associations, and said that I was violating his copyright by writing down what he said at WIPO and publishing it. The last day I was there, he came up to me and handed me a sheet of paper at the lunch break. He, he hadn't figured out how to hand me something electronic. But he handed me a sheet of paper at the lunch break, and, so, and I said, what's this? And he said, it's what I'm going to be saying at, uh, after lunch. I want to make sure that it's recorded accurately in your minutes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, a delegation from one country came in and said, you know, we were just ministerially reshuffled into here. We had no idea what was going on. We tried to read the official transcripts that the secretary prepared. They made no sense. We read yours. Now we know what's going on. Of course, that was our version. We now controlled the official version of how this treaty <laughs> Was proceeding, right? So this is the asymmetrical warfare that can be conducted with uh, with a little bit of electronic know-how when the other side has none. Yeah. Okay. This is this is going to seem kind of a letdown after all of these really deep questions mm -hmm. you've been able to talk on and on and on about. Um, as I was rereading this this morning when my train was delayed, um, I just wanted to know 
more about the uh, hidden camera detector. Uh huh. Because you don't, you didn't describe it in enough in enough detail for me to figure out how to build it, and my <laughs> network wasn't working well to have me. Uh, so to there, have me build there, one. There's a um, do you, do you who knows these website instructables? You guys know instructables. Some of you do. The, um, instructables is like YouTube for making stuff. <laughs> Okay. So they have like how to bake a cookie or how to embroider something or how to make a camera detector. And you just write out your, your, foot, your illustrated how-to. Um, and Instructables, like this book, my old intern from EFF works there, and they did a series of Instructables based on the book. And the first or second one was how to build that camera detector. So it, it's, okay. it's Googleable. Okay. So I'll go look for that. Yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Yeah? What is your thing with Disney? What's my thing with Disney? I wrote an entire novel to explain this. Um, uh, they, 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 so, I, uh, the, the, so I think that, um, that theme park rides are, in fact, an art form. Um, it's not an art form that's practiced by very many people, for obvious reasons. Uh, um, um, of those practitioners, I think the best ones work for Disney. Um, and the best examples are in the parks. Um, and I think that they're actually, in, as a gallery, the parks are, are a pretty interesting space. You know, if you wanted to go see some art in a gallery, that gallery is pretty cool. Uh, I think that it's possible to love the sin and hate the sinner. So I'm not very fond of Disney's politics and, and what they've done around the world in terms of their copyright agenda and their technology agenda. But I think that the, the, those rides are, um, are, 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 are a, brilliant works of art, and B, were hugely influential. They're some of the secret fabric of how um, many other media have progressed and, and how the narrative of the future and the past are constructed. Um, those, you know, when you think of things like the Carousel of Progress that was at the World's Fair in 64 here, uh, and that is the longest running stage show in the history of the world, um, it's given more performances than any other. Um, and, and the number of people who've gone in to discover what the future is about by watching these animatronic robots pantomime GE's version of the future. And that's, a, that's a actually a really significant piece of art. And, it, and not only is it weird and rep reprehensible in some ways, but it, it's also brilliantly executed and has a number of grace notes that, it, that reward close attention. As a, as a, as a medium to appreciate, um, theme park rides are actually an incredibly rewarding medium. Um, so, I mean, it has grace notes the way wine does, you know. Uh, it's 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 interesting stuff. Do you have a question that would be appropriate for an event of this kind, and do you have an answer to it? That's a that's a really good question. Um, I guess if I were a Googler, I would say, uh, well, what about the possibility that saving all this information now uh, that we haven't yet figured out what to do with? might prospectively have some value, and so we should be collecting it and saving it, because hard drives are cheap, and why don't we just save everything? And after all, every now and again, you, you turn over what you thought was a pot shirt, and it turns out to be the Rosetta Stone. Uh, would you like to ask, the, ask that question? Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, you are in a twisty maze of passages all alike. Um, so uh, my answer to that question <laughs> uh, is the one that I've been giving a lot of thought to on, uh, in thinking about what I would talk about here. And it's the, um, it's, the, it's the extremely non-speculative downside of totally uh, indiscriminate data collection, uh, which um, is, is not theoretical, it's real. It, it, it happens all the time that there's accidental disclosures due to this stuff, um, and more importantly, that there are deliberate ex uh, exposures due to this stuff. One of the things that we confront today is that um, we live in a society where the security apparatus has kind of lost its mind. We have this, we're having this autoimmune uh, disorder where the, the things that are supposed to protect us are in fact attacking us. And the best way not to have to turn over information about Google's users to the authorities is to not have that information. Um, so to the extent that we whittle down to the stuff that we need, we eliminate or mitigate that really non-theoretical risk of, of Google having to harm its users' interests, which will harm its business interests, by turning over that information at court order or you know Patriot Act point. Um, and, as, and there is that theoretical upside that you lose, but the theoretical upside compared to the non-theoretical downside. And then there is a theoretical downside, which is um, that when you collect that information, you collect it not just for the current masters of Google, but for everyone who might subsequently inherit it. And that's not just uh, Google and its successors, but also anyone who Google leaks it to or anyone who manages to extract it from Google at Patriot Act point. Yeah? 
Yeah, just general question. Uh, we're Google, yep. we build stuff. If you could have us build something, anything, yeah. um, what would be the most important thing we should build? The most important thing that could that be built. That we're not already doing. So I feel a, a dramatic lack of instrumentation in my life. Uh, so Google is a business that's superbly instrumented. Amazon's a business that's superbly instrumented. I was just at lunch with my agent. We were talking about how Amazon um, actually accounts for a relatively uh, a small fraction of the sales um, uh, of, of the average book. You know, and you have writers who find out that their Amazon sales rank of their best-selling book only accounts for, say, you know, a uh, hundred books a week or something, and they've sold a quarter million copies. And who can't figure it out because Amazon has got all this visibility into it, and so it feels like disproportionately like Amazon is kind of the center of the book-selling world. But for most books, most sales come through Barnes and Noble, and and Barnes and Noble has literally no transparency except for when you walk into the store. There are some uh, things that purport to be Amazon, or, um, Barnes and Noble's bestsellers uh, arrayed in a rack. You don't know if those are their actual bestsellers or the books that they wish would sell best, but they're in a rack at the front of the store. Um, Amazon, nevertheless, manages to extract uh, a really healthy living from its from its business, its its relatively unimportant book sales business by being better instrument that, instrumented than anyone else and being able to capitalize on very small opportunities. It's no coincidence. Jeff's a quant. He founded that company after having made his, his living for many years doing things like figuring out that there would be a 1 18th of a point spread between the Swiss franc and the euro in the next 48 hours and kind of moving a billion dollars into Swiss francs and then waiting and then moving it out again and, and just kind of arbitraging those extremely small quantitative differences. I don't have that in my life and anyone who purports to offer that to me in my life does so on the basis that they will sell whatever information they can glean about me to other people. Um, no one is building myware that lives on my computer or that uh, operates on a zero knowledge basis the way that Wasabe does and a few other technologies do where any, any information that I hemorrhage out to the rest of the world is A, under my strict control and scrutiny and B, is anonymized to the extent that it can be um, and then gets further anonymized at each aggregation point. Uh, instead, we have a kind of Google Calendar model where Google cal Calendar is superbly useful and, and there may and probably will be tools that help Google, Google Calendar build uh, better stats to help you understand how you live your life, uh, especially when combined with lots of other things. But nothing that lives on my computer that does that. And there's a whole lot that my computer could do. Uh, my wife Alice had the, this idea once for a piece of social software that kept track of who you communicated with intensely, um, you know, who you IM with, who you, um, who you email with, and who you phone, and then would notice when some of those people started to drop out of your radar. And it's been 30 days and you haven't called so-and-so. You used to call them once a week and before that it was once a day. Maybe you should give them a call, right? I don't have that tool and the right place to put that tool is not on the phone network, it's not in Google Mail, it's on my laptop. Uh, and no one's built that for me yet. So that would be the thing that I would love to have Google build for me. And then if Google wants to build a service off of it, I would love to have Google then say, okay, we're gonna take as much of this information as we can present in a zero knowledge way, shove it into a big cloud, data mine it, and, and give you back even more insight based on looking at a whole crowd of people. Um, a second thing that isn't the most important thing, but I realized after this book tour that I was just on, is a huge opportunity that no one's doing anything about, is um, book sense is the first time that booksellers have ever had any sense of how their books are selling. Uh, it's the point of sale scanner where you scan books as they're being sold, and it tots up something like 70% of the sales in the industry. And it's only available to uh, people who pay a lot of money to get access to it. The actual booksellers who provide the data can get some insight into their own sales patterns, but not into the whole thousand bookseller network of book sense, of book, uh, of book sense scans. Um, that's reserved to publishers who pay a lot of money for it. If you gave it to every little bookseller, then every little publisher, uh, especially the smaller ones who are fairly cheap and operate in razor thin margins, wouldn't buy BookSense accounts. They'd find a friendly local bookseller and call them 100 times a day and ask them how different books are performing. Um, I think that there's an enormous amount of value to publishing and to independent book selling in that data set. I think there's an opportunity for someone to really compete with BookSense um, uh, by taking that information and turning that into a, a, a public data set that then makes its money not by selling subscriptions to the data, but figuring out new revenue opportunities for what, what you do with the data. Uh, I think a lot of booksellers would lose a lot of productive hours to reloading stats on books that they liked, as would publishers and writers. But um, that, that uh, cognitive load or that drag on the marketplace would be offset by all the keen ways that people would gain insight into how books are selling. Uh, that would be a great Google product. Yeah. Hey there. Um, so I read the book. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um, I only have one minor quibble, and mm -hmm. it's just a comment. Um, mm -hmm. 
You can you can say what do you think of that at the end, and it's a question. <laughs> um, so, uh, I lived in the Bay Area for 11 years. So, when when I was reading, and you would make mention of Bart or Muni or uh, freeways, you would use the in front of them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've probably already heard this, but no one in the Bay Area uses the, and your characters are all from the Bay Area. So. Well. As a matter of fact, I lived in the Bay Area, and I did. So n it's oh, yeah, not yeah. technically true that no one does. At least one person did. True, um, true. Uh, uh, more to the point, uh, the Bay Area, Bay Area English is um, a moving target that's widely influenced by a, an extremely, um, uh, extremely mobile population who kind of drift in and out a lot. And in Southern California, the is Used. Is used I'm from Southern California. Always in, in front of the freeway names, right? You don't say I took five to Disneyland. You Correct. say I was I, I was stuck on the five, five for three and a half hours on my way to Disneyland. Um, so uh, absolutely, there's there's um, uh, that's true. Uh, if I thought about it, I probably would have fixed it. But in hindsight, I can call it a feature and not a bug because <laughs> it, it it just it's part of the world building. It's the magic of world building, and and in and in, in a non-specific. A uh, short number of years in the future, there will have been enough cross-pollination between the northern and southern halves of the state that the will have come to the Bay Area at last. They will have acquired the, the, uh, the definite article. We'll no longer call it Bay Area. <laughs> Maybe um, one more question? Yeah? No? Last question, anyone? All right. Well, thank you all very much.